book of Luke, the light giver. Come to this 13th chapter, which lets you know, don't ever, um, sin has nothing to do with natural occurrences. Uh, it is simply bad luck to be caught where the Tower of Siloam fell. But what you need to do is to repent, so regardless of where you are, you have eternal life made. It's that simple. And that was the teachings of Christ. And one of the other things he would have you grasp from that is don't ever let a local church put you in bondage from being free to do God's work, which uh, he healed this person on a Sabbath. And they came unglued. And he said, well, where, where is it written in the law that you can't heal on the Sabbath. Well, they wouldn't answer him. Why? Because it's not written there. You can heal any day. And, and so it is. And then he continues on, and he said, uh, kind of at his return, there's a lot of them, and this goes back to chapter 12, verses 1 through 8, that are going to fall off to the false Messiah. And when the true Christ returns, they're going to run to him and say, I'm a Christian. I attended your church. He said, you get away from me. I know you not. Why? Because they worship the false Messiah in ignorance. That's how bondage can work in a local religious organization if you're not careful. How do they work that? By not teaching God's Word chapter by chapter and verse by verse, whereby it is God's Word and not man's. So, therefore, he had completed in that 27th verse of saying, uh, I tell you, I know not whence you are. Depart from me, you workers of iniquity. And if you're worshiping Satan, false Messiah, if you don't know the difference, that's how Christ looks at it. Friend, you would be in bad shape. Verse 28, to continue the chapter, 13th chapter of the great book of Luke, and let's go with it. It reads, There shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth, when you shall see Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and all the prophets, they'll make it, in the kingdom of God and you yourself thrust out. This, this is one of the saddest things of Christianity, that people will sit on a church pew all their life, accepting the fact that they're saved, but yet they haven't even been taught what happens at the sixth trump, the false Messiah comes first. And they are simply taught, you don't have to know God's Word, you're going to be gone. And of course, Satan's message is, when he comes as false Christ, I've come to fly you away. So how sad it is that that's why there will be gnashing of teeth. The people are going to be so ashamed when they realize they worship the devil being good Christian people that they can't face the true Christ. Verse 29. And they shall come from the east and from the west and from the north and from the south and shall sit down in the kingdom of God. You know, this was prophesied of way back in the 49th chapter of the great book of Isaiah in verse 12. It was brought forth that uh, this gathering would take place. 30, and behold, there are last which shall be first and there are first which shall be last. You know, how many began working in God's garden? Well, many in the first earth age. And they were chosen first there. But they serve in the last generation here. Why? To stand against the false Messiah. It really doesn't matter what time of the day you come in to work in Father's garden, but how blessed it is to be knowledgeable about his plan and to be an able servant, knowing what God expects from you and what he wishes from you. Verse 31. The same day there came certain of the Pharisees, saying unto him, Get thee out uh, and depart thence, for Herod will kill thee. In other words, it's Herod's wish that he, he wants to do you in. Verse 32. And he said unto them, Go ye and tell that fox, Behold, I cast out devils, and I do cures today and tomorrow. And the third day, I will be perfected. It, it, my work is going to be completed. 33, nevertheless, I must walk today and tomorrow 
and the day following, for it cannot be that a prophet perish out of Jerusalem. And, uh, and so it is, it wouldn't, it wouldn't be practical, it would not be right. 34, O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, which killest the prophets, and stonest them that are sent unto thee, how often would I have gathered thy children together, as a hen doth gather her brood under her wings, and ye would not. You know, this, was, this is God's favorite place, not only in the world, but the universe, Mount Zion, and all the things that transpire there. In Christ, you could see the love. He, he would do this again at a different time in Matthew chapter 23, okay? And, but how, how he loved this particular place, and this is where the eternal kingdom shall be. So he mentions Jerusalem at the right time for when he returns, this will be the location in which he will return to. And how, how often, but, but time and things must happen as they are written. Well, why must they happen? Why can't God just end it? Every child of God must have the opportunity to be born of woman, and to make his or her mind up whether you're going to follow Satan or whether you're going to follow him. And until that chain is complete, then we continue on. I feel we're very near that time that we will see many wonderful things transpire. Verse 35, you continue. And behold, your house is unto you desolate, and verily I say unto you, you shall not see me until the time come when you shall say, blessed is he that cometh in the name of the Lord. And so it is that when he would, uh, there was a time coming very soon, <clears throat> he would be crucified and he would return to the Father until his enemy has made his footstool. And that's what we're in the business of, is putting the enemy down as his footstool. When you see the evil, wicked ways of this world and those that are in it that practice and participate in the opposite way in which God would have us go, then you can see and know how wonderful it's going to be when we come to that day that the division is going to happen, those that love him and those that don't, a great separation and a great time of teaching. So what a, what a fantastic chapter. Don't ever be put in bondage to Satan. Christ gave you power back in the 10th the, uh, chapter of this great book, in the 18th, 19th verse. He gave you power over all Satan's little tricks in the name of Jesus Christ. He gave you power not only to overcome them, but to tread on them, to put them down under the footstool and, and uh, therefore exercise that and be a free soul, loving our Heavenly Father and receiving His blessings. Chapter 14, verse 1, let's go with it. And it came to pass as he went into the house of one of the chief Pharisees to eat bread on the Sabbath day that uh, they watched him. They were always anxious to cut him down looking for him to do something they could accuse him of. And uh, so it is. But uh, he, he, would, uh, he knew that he was sent to sinners. He was sent to those, even these self-righteous hypocrites, to show them the true way. And, and so it was. So verse 2, And behold, there was a certain man before him which had the dropsy, this, this means in the Greek, watery, and this was a really excessive edema buildup, probably chronic heart failure. Um, would, would uh, something that, that, that a chronic heart failure could cause, that the, the edema is not being pumped properly. Verse 3, And Jesus answering spake unto the lawyers and Pharisees, saying, is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath day? Question. 
what did they say? Verse 4, and they held their peace. And he took him and healed him and let him go. Do you know why they did not answer him? Because there's nothing unlawful about it. They had nothing to say. Verse 5, and answering them, saying, which of you shall have an ass or an ox fallen into a pit and will not straightway pull him out on the Sabbath day? Uh, which of you wouldn't? Well, now, you're talking money now. It costs money to have those animals, and naturally we're going we're gonna to go out and pull, pull those animals out of the ditch. Yeah, sure. Putting animals over human beings. He's giving them a little Bible lesson here. You might make a note mentally of Exodus chapter 23, verse 5. This even concerns an enemies of cattle. Verse 6, and certainly he's kind of in an enemy camp, if you know what I mean. Verse 6, and they could not answer him again to these things. Why? There was no answer. There's no law against healing. And you can, you can just rest assured if one of them had an animal in a ditch, they would get him out to save the money. Seven, and he put forth a parable to those which had bidden when he marked how, which were, he put forth a parable to those which were bidden when he marked how they chose, uh, chose out the chief rooms and saying unto them, I mean, they're moving up to the highest, best places. Probably this is taking place at this Pharisee's house. I mean, we're, we're uptown here, okay? Eight, when thou art bidden of any man to a wedding, sit not down in the highest room, lest a more honorable man than thou be bidden of him. So what do you do? Verse nine, and he that bade thee and him come and say to thee, give this man place. And then began, and thou began with shame to take the lowest room. How, 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 what a shame that would be. But you bring it on yourself when you take the high place. You know, pride is what was the, that was the downfall of Satan. Okay. Was prideful within him, pride within himself. Ten. But when thou art bidden, when you're asked, go and sit down in the lowest room, that when he hath bade thee come up, that he may say unto thee, friend, go up higher, then shalt thou have worship in the presence of them that sit at meat with thee. You, you will have respect and you will have earned it uh, with those that are sitting there. But again, pride is what brought down Satan. And certainly Christ, more humble than anyone that ever walked this earth in that he even washed his own disciples' feet. And of course, the deeper teaching being that only Christ can wash the dirt of this earth off of you in sin, that is to say, uh, your sins. Verse 11, for whosoever exalteth himself shall be abased. And he that humbles himself shall be exalted. That's, that's just the way it is. And how, how wonderful it was that our Christ, our Savior, the Anointed One, walked among us and even gave himself for us in our weakness and sinful lives that on repentance, as he would say back in that 13th chapter, repent and gain eternal life. He, he, he stepped and set that course for us. And certainly, um, this is a lesson in life that is very profitable, for it does elevate you. And what he's saying is you can count on it. If you'll be humble, and if you'll do your best, you're going to be exalted. You're going to move on up. Verse 12. Then said he also to him that bade him, this would be the Pharisee that brought him, when, when thou makest a dinner or a supper, call not thy friends, 
nor thy brethren, neither thy kinsmen, nor thy rich neighbors, lest they also bid thee again, and a recompense be made to thee. If you do, they're going to they're gonna expect to return it to you, and here we go in that big circle, okay, of, uh, of entertaining each other. 13, but when thou makest a feast, call the poor, the main, the lame, and the blind. In other words, um, uh, when, when the feast is spiritual, when you want to feed the people, feed them the Word of God, then call the sinners and call the, the wounded that need healing. Call those that need the Lord Jesus Christ. Not, not a bunch of goody-goody two-shoesers, um, hypocrites, right, self-righteous hypocrites. That You don't want those at a feast. Why? They're not going to accept it. But call sinners. You see, that's who Christ was sent to. 14, and thou shalt be blessed, for they cannot recompense thee. They're not able to. For thou shalt be recompensed at the resurrection of the just. And the just is God's elect. That's the way God's elect should keep their minds in gear. To think and to serve and to share truth with those that are hungry for it. And this world today is hungry for that truth. How precious it is that uh, truth is so... Um, such a famine for it because of bondage to Satan and traditions of men. That to teach God's Word in the simplicity in which is written, salvation to those, to the sinners that need it, the doctor to the sick to heal them spiritually and uh, bring that truth to the world. And, and that's the reward of the just, is when he returns. Verse 15, And when one of them that sat at meat with him heard these things, they were listening, he said unto him, Blessed is he that shall eat bread in the kingdom of God. Now you get, you're getting close to it there. Why? Well, Christ is the bread of life. 16, Then said he unto them, A certain man, made a great supper, and he bade many. I mean, he really sent out the invitations. 17, and he sent his servant at supper time to say to them that were bidden, come, for all things are now ready. It's, we're, we're ready to feed here. 18, and they all with one consent began to make excuse. The first said unto him, I have brought a piece of ground, and I must needs go and see it. I pray thee have me excused. See, sometimes you can just get too busy to want to feast on God's Word. Just got other things to do. 19. And another said, I have bought five yoke of oxen. Oh, have I got it. I'm a richy one. And I go to prove them. I pray thee, have me excused. Just bought two new cars. I, just, I look so good in them. I want to get out there and let the neighbors see me drive by. Okay. Same, kind of the same way. You've got, got a rich attitude here. Not time for God's Word. Don't have time to come and study. Don't have time to, to feed off the bread of life. 20, and another said, I've married a wife, um, and therefore I cannot come. And that, that was, a, one was not to go to war or anything else for a given period of time at a new marriage. 21, so that servant came and showed his Lord these things. They're not coming. Okay. Then the master of the house, being angry, said to his servant, go out quickly into the streets and lanes of the city and bring in hither the poor and the maimed and the halt and the blind. We're going to feed them the word of God. The blind will see. The lame will walk. The halt will stand up. 22. 
And the servant said, Lord, it is done as thou hast commanded, and yet there is room. There's always room for more in the Lord's house. There is always room for more to accept the Lord Jesus Christ, to repent and gain eternal life. There's always room. It's just like um, when he fed the multitude with the little fishes and the five loaves of bread. There's always room for more. 23, and the Lord said unto the servant, go out into the highways and edges and compel them to come in that my house may be filled. In other words, you keep teaching that word, keep feeding them and they will come and they will. If you will teach God's word chapter by chapter and verse by verse, if you will explain God's word in such a way that anyone can understand it, take that that is difficult and simplify it where a child can understand it. That's true wisdom and that's the simplicity in which Christ taught to bring blessings and eternal life to whomsoever will. Verse 24, and I say unto you that none of, these, uh, none of those men which were bidden shall taste of my supper. Um, those that um, would refuse to come, none of them are ever going to have eyes to see or ears to hear. They, they cut themselves off. And there's a reason for that. If, if you don't have time for our Father, He's not going to take time with you. Well, why waste the time? I mean, look at it in a real way. If you don't have time for God, why should He have time for you? You're worthless as far as He is concerned. What are you good for if you always have an excuse to be somewhere where you're not supposed to be? when it comes time to serve the living God. What good are you? And naturally the answer is obvious, you're no good. And so it is, that's why he's there. Because they're no good and because they're not in the right frame of mind, they're never going to taste of the bread of life and nor receive the blessings of God until there is a change. Verse 25, he'll give us an example. And there, went, and there went great multitudes with him, and he turned and said unto them, I mean, the miracles, they attract people. Feed them and they will come. You need to, teachers of God's word need to take an example of that. What draws people? The word of God. Chapter by chapter and verse by verse. 26, if any man come to me and hate not his father and mother and wife and children and brethren and sisters, yea, and his own life. Also, he cannot be my disciple, he cannot discipline himself. Now, we all know there's something wrong with that translation. Absolutely, uh, God is not a teacher of hate. And certainly he respects family. So when you know there is something wrong, take the word hate and take it back in the Greek and translate it in the Greek. And what does it really say? It is miseo. Uh, well, what does it mean? It means to love less. It means you must even love your own self and your family less than you do he that died on the cross for you. He loved you enough that he gave his all. So he does expect you to put him number one. Don't put him off. Don't go look at a piece of land and put off the Lord. Don't, don't, don't go try out a new car and what have you before the Lord. All that comes second. You have to love him more. You have to put him number one. You have to be, if you're going to be a disciple, that's the way it is. Verse 27, and whosoever doth not bear his cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. Well, now, now what is a cross for? Well, that's what they crucify people on. 
what it means is you must be willing to give it all for me. You must pick it up and walk with me and be that, have that conviction if I can use you. And that's as it is. There is no way you can ever teach God's word. There is no way you can ever be that disciple if in your lifetime, the Word of God doesn't come number one. Everything else must be second place. Everything else must fall after that. That the study, the teaching, and the blessings of the people must come first. The feeding must come first. And, and uh, you cannot have nor allow anything to come in the path or the way of bringing forth the Word of God to those that are so ever needful of it today. Verse 28, For which of you, intending to build a tower, sitteth not down first, and counteth the cost, whether he have sufficient to finish it? In other words, when you plan something, just like you plan your life, you got to carry it all through. you got to know what you're doing. 29, lest happily, this is what could happen, lest happily after he had laid the foundation and is not able to finish it, all that be, behold it began to mock him. And there you just turn out to be a, a laughing stock. So always know what you're doing. And when, when you're going to follow the Lord, you sit down and you put it out there and decide. Verse 30, saying, this man began to build and was not able to finish. Um, that doesn't go that far in God's book. Now, there is a big difference in being a quitter and not finishing. Pick up, go again, okay? N never be a quitter. Always take a different course, make it work. 31, or what king going to make war against another king sitteth not down first, and consulteth whether he be able with 10,000 to meet him that cometh against him with 20,000. Well, now let's think about this a minute. We got 10,000 and there comes 20,000 over the hill. We have a problem. We are pretty well outnumbered. So unless you have some great um, military weapon you're in a heap of hurt, okay? So what do you do, 32? Or else, if you don't have that, while the other is yet a great way off, he's not there yet, he sendeth an ambassador, let's say an ambassador, and desireth conditions of peace. You sue for peace before they ever get there. Think ahead. You know, th this, this works well even in your life today when you wake up in the morning Wake up a little bit earlier than needful and meditate and plan your whole day how you're going to do it and what you're going to do if something doesn't work this way or that and something goes wrong here, an alternate around it, what you can do to repair it, fix it, go on. Then, then um, you're, and, and as you've always heard me say, take care of the hard stuff first and the rest of it will just sail right on by. You'll, you'll do just fine. So what he's saying here is think what you're doing. Love the Father most in your life. Be committed to do his will and always think out what you're going to do where you're not a failure, okay? There's nothing wrong with falling short and getting up and going again. And uh, certainly life isn't over at a failure if you've done your best, but pray for wisdom and meditate again and get it right. Thir 33, so likewise, whosoever he be of you that forsaketh not all that he hath, he cannot be my disciple. You gotta put him first, okay? That's the way it is. You gotta have that commitment. Do you know one way he's putting it here? Listen to it. Do you know why he wants a disciple like this? Well, like what? Well, listen, 34, salt is good. But if the salt hath lost his savor, wherewith shall it be seasoned? In other words, you, you can take just a plain old potato 
and, and prepare it, uh, bake it, and taste it, it, it's pretty bland. I mean, it is just pretty bland. But you can just sprinkle a little salt on it and mm, yummy. I mean, it really makes the old taste bud zing. And that's what he expects his disciples to be able to do, is to make a difference, to make things palatable, to be able to season things in the due season. Verse 35, that old salt, though, that has just lost it, it is neither fit for the land nor yet for the dunghill, but men cast it out. He that hath ears to hear, let him hear. And, and so it is that with, this, with the salt, if, if you are a disciple and you've lost that drive, you've lost your flavor, the savor, you're, you're no good. You can't make a change in people's lives. But if you have that zing of sea salt, to change that seasoning, to make it as it should be, then you bring hope to all peoples that will hear what you have dedicated yourself to do is to bring forth the Word of God. You want to be His disciple? Be salty. Be, that makes a difference. It changes the flavor. And people okay, notice Okay, and it. question time. We're going to go with um, Rich from Maryland. Question, you said we will see our loved ones during the millennium, but not eternity. No, no, no. Why not the eternity? I think you misunderstood. Probably what I said was, is you will see them in the millennium, but, and if they don't make the eternity at the second resurrection, you won't see them because they're going in the lake of fire. But we're not to judge people. We know you can help them even in the millennium. But you certainly will be with them for the eternity. There's, there's those that make it. And um, in your case, I know you got no sweat. She, uh, um, your mate's going to make it. Just A number one, and you will be with her for the eternity. Kat Katrina from Florida. Um, Kay, uh, I have a question for Pastor Murray. Could you please explain a bit of history about Mary Magdalena? Before listening to you, I grew up in a church that did not teach me much about her. I love your teachings. Well, thank you, Katrina. There is not all that much written about Mary Magdalena, but there is some false teachings about her. I don't know why it is, but many people say she was a prostitute. And there is absolutely not one word in the scripture to back that up. Quite the contrary. The only thing that is written about her before her conversion is that she had seven demon spirits, seven evil spirits, which that, that's a pretty heavy load. And Christ healed her. And she was so faithful and so loyal to him after that. She was one of the ones that went to the tomb and and uh, she loved the Lord with all her heart. Why? He cleansed her of those seven evil spirits that, and, um, and gave her that um, presence that she had in his service. And she was a good servant to the living God. Okay, uh, Patricia from Georgia. How can I get peace? Of, how can I get peace of knowing I'll be in heaven when I die. I study with you about every day, and I pray to the Father, please help me. I respect you highly. Well, thank you. I appreciate that. Um, if you believe, you have eternal life. It's that simple. John 3, 16, God so loved this world that he gave his only begotten Son that whomsoever would believe upon him, and you do believe, you study every day, should not perish. You're not going to perish, but will have eternal, unending life. So you, you've got it made. You have that guarantee. And he does guarantee it. And congratulations. 
Uh, Billy from Alabama. My question is, there are 7,000 election and there are 7,000 fallen angels. Well, there is, according to Romans chapter 11, you have the 7,000 elect, and according to Revelation chapter 11, um, you have uh, 7,000 uh, fallen angels. Uh, to hear the one of them do, uh, fallen angels, do, do you think it's possible to have one of them assigned to each of the 7,000 election in an attempt to keep us from following, foiling Satan's plan? Of course, the, he knows us. He knew us from the first earth age. They do. And that's going to be their business is to try to mess up what we have to do. Only we got power over them. And we're going to take names and we're going to kick dragon. That's the way it is. Uh, Darlene from Ohio. Why did Eve thank God for the man-child Cain when she said, I have gotten a man from the Lord before Abel was born? Well, she was continuing in labor and gave birth to Abel. They were twins. But she was innocent. She didn't know. She said, Ish, it, Yahweh. In other words, with God's help, I have, I have a, a man child. She, she did not know. I mean, she was innocent and in how all this came to pass. She was deceived and beguiled by Satan. And um, as, as Genesis uh, chapter 4, verse 1 stipulates, Adam knew her also. So she had twins by, by uh, it is believed by many, by separate fathers, and be that as it may. She was being innocent. That was her words. That's motherly instinct, okay? Perry from Georgia. My name is Perry. I'm from Georgia. I have a question for you and maybe a favor to ask. I understand that we must anoint ourselves with olive oil when asking for healing, but we also must contact the elders also. I don't go to church in a normal sense, but I do listen to your program almost daily, and I thank God for the opportunity to do so. I'm thinking that you are the elder that I need to contact. Well, you have, and you are an elder also, and that's all that's necessary. You anoint yourself and ask the Lord Jesus Christ to touch you, and so be it. Bless you for your faith, and your faith will heal you. Uh, Kip from Wisconsin, can we in spiritual bodies in the Gulf be deceived by Antichrist or is the deception for only the living on earth? The, 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 the story is already written for those that are in paradise. Uh, you are either on one side or the other. You either made it or you didn't, period. And you must remain in that position. It is written in Revelation 20, verse 5, the, rest, the ones that don't make it are considered spiritually dead. And they must remain spiritually dead until the end of the millennium and to take part in the second resurrection and have eternal life or the second death, which puts them in the lake of fire. That's their business. Satan cannot affect anyone in paradise. I have learned more about the Bible listening to Shepherd's Chapel for two years than all the churches I've attended in 56 years. Thank God for your program. Well, we thank Him that we can bring it to you. And uh, thank you so much. Uh, Paul from Florida. Pastor Murray, would you please explain why the 12 tribes split up? Well, it wasn't by their choosing necessarily. In about... Um, 600 B.C., the Assyrian took the ten northern tribes captive. That split them. There wasn't any, any, uh, any uh, decision on their part. They were taken prisoners. And those ten tribes, he didn't bother the two southern tribes. He took those ten tribes and he took them over the Caucasus Mountains, ultimately, and they would end up in Europe, knowing, known as, as Caucasians because of the Caucasus Mountains. And later, the, and Celts, they were known as. And they would settle Europe, and then many of them later migrate to the United States and Canada. And uh, there you have those tribes. In God we trust. There is a reason for everything. God promised that those tribes would become as numerous as the stars of heaven and the sands of the sea. Where are they today? Well, they're where I said they were. 
There is nothing evil or contemptible about that. It is not cultish. It is a fact in God's Word. Now, 200 years later, Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, came and he took the other two tribes captive. And, uh, and so it was. That's why you have the house of Judah, and that's why you have the house of Israel. And the two will ultimately, on the great wonderful day, be joined back into one stick. But not yet. Uh, Mary from Florida, when Christians say a person takes a Jezebel, has a Jezebel spirit, what are they really meaning to implying? God bless you. Uh, thank you. Well, uh, it, uh, Jezebel's spirit, Jezebel was evil. I mean, you know, she was, she had it all her way, not God's way. And she would, um, uh, she being wicked enough that she would even try to destroy Elijah. And she would send 50 men to pick old Elijah up and God would, I mean, destroy them. Another group of 50. Uh, Jezebel had a wicked, wicked heart, and that's what it means as a person that is really, really wicked. Sandra from Michigan, please tell me when was Jesus born? If he was conceived on December the 25th, like you said, was Jesus born in September of the next year? My grandson is seven and was born on September the 26th. He says he and Jesus were born on the same day. This year, he said, Happy Birthday, Jesus, and he smiled. Well, he's a bright little boy because that's exactly about how it is. Uh, September the 26th to the 29th was um, the day that, um, that he was born. It, it is, this is not an unknown thing to many people. And um, one of, uh, I was shocked in doing the documentary the last man out of Silver City in, in um, that great mining town that the, the interpreter that went with us, our guide's name was um, um, Noel. And I asked him, uh, we were way out in the boonies. I mean, we were at a, an old mining camp and uh, what was left of it, and it was what we call a dugout. I don't know how many of you know what a dugout is. That's kind of a, call it an earthen cellar. Uh, but it, it happened to be back at the, when the bar, when the mine was open, it was a bar in a dugout. Uh, they sold booze there to the miners. And we were checking out the artifacts that still remained there. And I asked him, I said, why, uh, he was a Choctaw Indian. And I said, why, why did your mother name you Noel? And he said, because I was born on Christ's birthday in September. And of course, I, know, I knowing that from the scriptures uh, about freaked me out. That, um, so here that this Choctaw knew this and his mother even named him that. And that gives me great hope. And of course, among the American Indians, there's a lot more truth in, than uh, study of God's Word than one might think. Anyway, be that as it may, congratulations to your grandson. He's a sharp young man. Uh, Terry from California. I'm having trouble understanding why Judah is the Jewish tribe and the rest of the brethren are Israel all having the same mothers and fathers, please tell, help me understand. Well, there was 12 of them, and they all had, they were, each had their own tribes. Judah is, uh, let's, let's go to, I'll go to the Greek, Eudas. To, you are either of Eudas, and there's two ways you can be an Eudas. That is to say, by birth from Judah himself, lineage to lineage, or you can be in the land of Judea and be a resident there. And then you carry that same title by residence, not by birth, okay, or by race. But the other tribes, um, you take like, uh, like Paul himself, uh, made it very clear he was a Benjamite. And 
naturally, everybody likes their own children to be called from their name. And so it was. Uh, you might say, well, how, can, how do you know Paul was a Benjamite? Well, when he was shucking the old cob down, not by religion, residence, geographically speaking or otherwise, but his actual birth, he made it very clear in Romans chapter 11, I am of the seed of Abraham of the tribe of Benjamin. So that, that pretty well, that narrows it down as to where he came from. Okay. He was a Benjamite. Uh, let's see, I cannot read that name. From Montana, I, I'm going to call it Valerie. Okay, Valerie from Montana. Question, could you explain about the rapture and is it false? Thank you. I've, I've just recently started watching you here in Montana. I love your teaching on our, of our Father's Word to us and how you explain it. I have learned so much in these past few months. Well, it, that, that is good. The word rapture is not in God's Word. And many people take uh, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, beginning with verse 14, where it states very clearly, and a child can understand it, if you believe Christ rose from the dead, then you better believe all those that sleep in Him have risen also. And they're not out here in a hole in the ground. They're with the Lord. Okay? Why? God is the God of living, not the dead. But at the seventh trump, the furthest one out, we all meet him. The word air in the Greek here as it is used is, is, is breath of life. And ambivalent air that we breathe, breath of life. Okay, spiritual body in other words. We are changed and, uh, and join him. Not in the air, but right here on earth to do his work because his kingdom will be established here. Thank you. It's good to have you with us. Uh, Danielle from North Carolina. My question is about uh, blasphemy. I have cursed using God's name and used his name in vain before, and I'm wondering if from doing that will keep me from going to heaven, sincerely. N not in the least, okay? That's forgivable. When you repent, he said, I don't even want to hear about it again. It's gone. The blasphemy of the Holy Spirit is for one of God's elect. Let's say, Daniel, that you realize the false Christ is coming first. And the Holy Spirit wants to speak through you to the whole world when you're delivered up before the false Messiah. If you refuse the Holy Spirit, as it was written in the 12th chapter, verses 1 through 12, where we just covered the other day, when you're delivered up before that synagogue of Satan in Luke, the book of Luke 1, 11, uh, 12, 1 through 8, if, if you refuse the Holy Spirit the privilege of speaking through you, that's blaspheming the Holy Spirit, and it's unforgivable. But only God's elect, and I'm pretty sure you are, would have the privilege of committing that sin. But using the Lord's name in vain past times, uh, losing a temper or something of that nature, is forgivable. As he walked in the flesh, that being forgivable. Go back and reread Luke chapter 12, verses 1 through 10 or 12, especially verse 10. Okay, we got, well, here we have, um, uh, who do I have here? My name. Uh, ben, my name is, I am eight years old. My name is Ben. Did the other guys on the cross believe in God? My grandma listens to you every day. Well, well, um, that's fantastic. I'm glad you listen also. One of them had a conversion on the cross. They were malefactors, which means they were sinners. And one of them converted because Christ said to him, I say to you, this day I will see you in paradise. And, and so it was. Uh, good to have you with us, Ben. And you got, you got a sharp grandma. You sure do. Um, and let's see, this must be your sister. What was Jesus' middle name? This is um, Hannah. I'm age nine. My grandma listens to you every day. Sounds like this grandmother's got quite a flock following her here. 
Faith Snyder sent in a question to you, and she is my cousin. Well, well, God bless you all. Again, I, I'm going to say that um, your grandmother is, is she's, she's a good woman. You, I know you all love her. Jesus' middle name is when you convert Yeshua, it is Yahweh's Savior, Messiah. So his middle name is Savior, and, and so it is. That's why he's, it's pronounced Jesus.